Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. In fact, uh, standards as far as the time also is concerned. <laughs> and uh, I think we will have several interested responses. So please uh, go ahead. Would you prefer that we take a group of questions together or would you like to do it as the company? Uh, maybe uh, following the standard format that we usually do in ISAS discussions, three in one go. So please introduce yourself and ask your question. The, 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 the system um, and there is a chance for this to be rectified, what would you recommend to be done for Air India? I mean, uh, it is really a losing concern by all, by any standard. Uh, so, would you recommend that it be so off because you, you, you cannot be pouring uh, money in into a concern that is not really working. We can take uh, one more question for this round. Any anybody wants to come in? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for a useful exposition of what's happening, not only in the department of U.S. Davis and East Province. I think it is spread over time, over all government departments and bureaucracies everywhere uh, in India. We didn't have this problem ourselves in Singapore, because we sent all the civil servants to school at night. And to make sure they don't work at daytime. The yeah. lecturer <laughs> was the governor that we had come into power. 100% majority, and this is the way you will behave as civil servants. So lectures were given and all that. But you know, this is a small country, so things can be done, and the effect of it can be found, and that's what a village like ours was as compared to what it is today. So you mentioned uh, Rajasthan, the chief minister was here over the last two days, and yesterday she was giving a lecture. She was amazed at what happens in Singapore when she was here in 98 compared to what it is now. Uh, so this, this is across the board. But now what I'd like to know is they are with a government that is elected, it's no longer coalition by a majority and several states under that government uh, party. Uh, do you see now uh, change uh, uh, occurring in India across the board, not only in the state department, but all over, uh, all, all, all over India? The reason I'm asking is also because we need India to be a strong India because the whole of Asia is changing. You cannot have strength in one side and weakness on the other. And the whole lot of us that live in ASEAN are in danger of being pushed this way or the other. There must be a neutrality across the board. So I
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So yeah. I'll hand it back to Mr. Wright. Oh, okay. Let me go in order of seniority. Let me take the third one first. Mm -hmm. Question first. Um, let me say some. You know, uh, Thank you. I gave you the dreary part of what India has the, uh, gone through. But I must tell you, as an individual, as an official serving in India, over what has happened over the last two years, I'm very upbeat, I'm very bullish in the fact that we are coming out of this morass today. The trough has been reached. The graph is on the upward, and I'll give you three examples of why I'm saying, why I'm seeing green shoots everywhere. Let, let us take the political establishment first. A simple event, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but we have in, in India a provision where a politician if he is convicted in a court of law, he cannot stand for election. Unless that conviction is stayed by a higher court. And if that stay is pending, he can continue to be. Unfortunately, this kind of a provision was looked at very adversely by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court came down with a verdict which said that anybody, any politician, who's been convicted on a criminal offense involving a punishment of more than two years, stands permanently disqualified from contesting elections. I think that was a, a, a watershed. It was actually a, an excellent uh, landmark kind of a verdict that came. But obviously, it was very uncomfortable to a large number of politicians. They, want, they try to introduce a bill in Parliament to circumvent this by introducing an amendment in the Representation of People's Act. It didn't come about in time. Then the government decided to introduce an ordinance failing that bill which was in Parliament. The Council of Ministers even passed that ordinance. It was to go to the President for him to sign. Whereupon, a large, large element of the younger politicians, members of parliament, in the age group of 40 plus minus, they felt it would be very difficult for them to go to the electorate and explain why this ordinance was passed, why a so-called tainted politician is allowed to contest LA elections. And I am aware of 17 of those members of parliament in the age group 40 odd who were wondering how to overcome this problem. This ultimately, the problem landed up onto the table of what is otherwise known as the vice president of the Congress party. You don't, people don't know too many of them as vice president of the Congress party. You know him by the name of Rahul Gandhi. To bell the cat. It was not a figment of his imagination. It was a groundswell of opinion which came across party line, not the Congress party alone. I, uh, three, four, five of these members of parliament I know who are from other parties also, to tell the cat. And then, of course, the famous rhetoric where he goes before public media and says, look, this ordinance is nonsense. And he te tears it up and he says it has to be torn. He gave the signal to his own government saying that, no, don't introduce this. The theatrics of that action aside, the point I'm driving at is that there was this 17 people across party lines, younger members of parliament, who felt that look, we cannot henceforth going forward go to the public with this kind of a thing. You look at it in, 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 in the business community. Cronies had developed of all kinds, you know. I'm crony of party A, I'm crony of party B, I'm crony of party C, who are getting all the contracts. Across party lines, the younger elements again said, Enough is enough. We will rather play the game by the rules of the game than jump the queue and get ahead for contracts or whatever it was. And why I'm saying that is that I spent about a year speaking to various business groups which are known as young presidents organizations. Quite uh, years. Quite years. Yeah. Entrepreneurs organizations, etc. Lots of cities in the country. And each one of these, these YPOs are in the age group 50 plus minus, 45 plus minus. That's right. All of them say that enough is enough. We, they, we will go against the wishes of our own elders if we have to run business of this kind. We'd rather run it the way it should be done. 
in the bureaucracy, I can, I, I can, you've heard of some instances, but two, three of them, there was a famous incident of a young subdivision magistrate in a city called Noida, which is adjacent to Delhi, which she was suspended by the government because she was demolishing a wall which had unauthorizedly done a five case. Where I can name about 20 different similarly placed in similar age group officers who were sending clear signals to the politicians that if you want us to do an irregular thing, give it to us in writing. There's no way in which we will allow you to use us to do something which is irregular in some way. I mean, so the across a cross section of society, you are finding these green shoots, as I call them, and that's what leads me to believe that is bullish. The graph is definitely upward. The graph, I mean, the gradient of the graph may not be very extreme, but it was, it is definitely in the right direction, and I think the country has realized that they cannot be in the state that we were, say, about three years back. So then the Kerala model. The Kerala model actually is a socio-economic development kind of model. I've worked long years in the state uh, on health, on you know, lots of other issues. Uh, most of the other things that have been pointed out over here are issues of you know granting maybe contracts, going grabbing rights of exploration, etc., to commercial institutions. That model has been very, uh, what should I say, successfully worked in other states. Gujarat model also works some, something along that kind of line. It has been worked in the Northeast also. Uh, Madhya Pradesh is doing it, Chhattisgarh is doing it, those models. But they are most, more, more in the social sector issues, rural health, rural education, primary education, etc. And they worked effectively, may not necessarily apply to these kind of situations, but of course, those are models which are success of its own. Air India, I don't want to make a policy pronouncement over here because it will be picked up by media and tomorrow, for me, my own country will deny me a visa to enter back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Air India is bleeding the national exchequer, is bleeding the government treasury. I don't think uh, with the kind of huge debt liabilities that they have run up, it will ever be able to turn the corner. Uh, drastic steps are required. I really don't want to comment on whether selling Air India or privatizing it is the only solution. There are two, three schools of opinion which are working in that direction. One school, of course, certainly is that privatizing it is the only solution. But any private person who takes it over will obviously have to take it over with a huge amount of debts it has, huge amount of uh, employee it has, and the aging aircraft that it has. So it's not going to be an easy solution to merely privatize. I've not answered your question, but I don't intend to answer it. <laughs> yeah, the next round, Surya. I'm Surya from Pfizer. So there is this famous saying that the buck stops at a particular level, say the President of the United States or Korea. And using buck in a pump, in the cases you have dealt with as CAG, where did the buck really stop? Of course, the government has said compulsions are coalition politics. But were there other compulsions other than just the compulsions are coalition politics? Secondly, I mean, you have shifted from being an administrator to being a CAG. Did you find any challenges in doing that transition? And if I can have one more question. Okay. Once a journalist can never change in this color. Anyway, experience. Was there any particular state level malfeasance of the magnitude which could be described as Himalayan proportions? Sir, maybe we can skip one more. Sure. Hi, I'm Drugo. Um, I'm an independent consultant in shipping. Um, okay, all right. Um, 
my question is uh, how much of the CAG's action? Well, I, I, I feel every institution's activities are somewhat shaped by the leadership's personality. So how much of CAG's actions and steps taken, in your view, uh, were shaped by your own personality? Uh, the second question is, if we draw a parallel to the corporate world, uh, if, C if a CEO is um, uh, caught in doing uh, unethical activities, he will not simply get fired, but uh, there'll be, you know, he'll be sued, there'll be cases uh, against him. In the political context, uh, uh, as um, the story I was saying, the buck stops at somebody. Uh, in this case, it should be with the executive uh, leadership, uh, which means the prime minister. Uh, is it just right that the CEO gets fired, which means the prime minister gets fired, not being re-elected in the office? Is it enough? Or there should be other mechanism for which political leadership should be held accountable. Uh, they face the consequences for taking actions which does not take the national interest um, uh, into account. Thank you. Thank you. So for at least one of these questions, you'll have to be your own arbiter. <laughs> how your yeah. personality shaped uh, the CG's function. But please go ahead. Uh, Surya, yeah. That's John Kennedy who kept that uh, Thing on, the, on this desk which says the buck stops here. Uh, <clears throat> my examples would be two. India go to play cricket in UK, lose all the five test matches or be lost four and one was washed out, something like that. Obviously the demands were on the captain of the team to resign and not be allowed to captain the Indian team anymore. So the, the top man, the CEO or the captain takes the hit. Uh, the other example is, uh, uh, but four months back, five months back, we had a series of fires or accidents which took place in the naval establishment in India. And it was the chief of the Navy resigned. who resigned. I think that was an excellent example he was setting. He could, by himself, in no way be held responsible for the accidents which were taking place in Mumbai, or Vishakapatnam or places like that. But he owned up moral, moral responsibility and resigned. I think ultimately the CEO has to take the call. So he gets the reward or he takes the hit for it. Buck has to stop with him. So now what should happen? And I'm combining uh, uh, Drugo's question also in this about cor you know, parallels in the corporate world. What can you really do? Ideally, I think if the legal situation in India ever had to improve such people who occupy such high positions beyond compulsions of coalition politics or whatever it may be, should be tried for being anti-national. But I don't know whether there is a law which can and then because these are, you know, you are, as I said earlier, subjugating the national, nation's interest to a party or a, or a political party. Basically. So, uh, what we can do with them, for the time being, at least I would be satisfied if we ensure that we throw up the country, throws up leaders who are capable of rising above partisan party politics and ensuring that the oath that they take allegiance to the constitution overrides everything else. That their patriotism is to the country, to the constitution, and not only to the political party or the government itself. If this can be a lesson for the future, I think our ends will be served. Challenges in uh, transition, sitting in a uh, arbitration, whatever it was, it was absolutely, in some ways, let me say, traumatic. And all the guys who I have called names for 35 years in, years in my career, which means the auditors. I'm made to sit on the other side and say, now, now poetic justice is done to me that you become the auditor yourself. But very soon I realized that there was a tremendous method in their madness, if I can say so. Auditing 
is that essential ingredient in every society, in every government, or in every corporate institution, which is an absolute must. Audit shows you the mirror. And I think audit is absolutely essential in every other way. And the only two differences could be there are two options available, especially in a government kind of setup. Either what audit has pointed out, you draw upon those lessons, take remedial or corrective action. Then society at large benefits. The other is you just stonewall audit observations. Nothing can really be done, as has not been done. And you forget all about it, then society loses. Governance loses, the country loses, the exchequer loses, or whatever it may be. Malfeasance at the state level, uh, let's hope that sto story erupts any time. Dig deep into it, Maharashtra irrigation. It's absolutely gigantic proportions. How much have been spent, has been spent and how much good has been done in the field of irrigation or providing irrigation facilities to agriculture or anything else. The other incident uh, is Uttarakhand, where hydroelectric power stations have been sent, uh, set up on the Ganges and similar other rivers, where environment and ecology has been thrown to the winds, and where we had these series of accidents in Uttarakhand about two years back. For two years back, there was a direct consequence of such ignoring of ecological concerns. Uh, well, uh, you were the other question of uh, personalities having institutions. Actually, it's institutions who write their own destiny. It's not so much personalities. Uh, it does happen at times that people do stir up conscience about things. But in our particular case, two things that happened, which were very supportive. One was, surprisingly, most surprisingly, we got a very positive and constructive media which did play a very positive role, except for one or two stray cases where it was very interested or kind of media intervention. Media played a very constructive role. Often they are on overdrive, often they are peeping into bedrooms of people, but this was one time when they actually made a very positive role. But most important, and the supportive part of it was the judiciary. See, governance ultimately, if I can say so, governance is, is, is a, is a zero-sum game. You have three elements, the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. If any one of these three pillars is not performing its role properly, is ceding space, the other will eventually get into that space. And if it's the judiciary, they will not look at from the standpoint of the larger macroeconomic concern, which means if I'm canceling 122 licenses, will it disrupt <coughs> maybe mining or maybe the telecom sector. What is the image that India will, you know, generate to the rest of the world? What will be the effect upon the economy of the country? They will look at it strictly from the legalistic standpoint. They look at it in a silo that they that they function. So obviously they look at it legally, and hence the judiciary took the stand that they took, ignoring everything else. So that's why I said. Uh, <coughs> The support was of these two agencies, which is absolutely remarkable. And then the more important part of it is that the department, the auditors, professionally very competent, totally apolitical, and unimpeachable facts and evidence that they brought forth. And that was probably the strongest part of these reports, where they have not been able to challenge the reports for the facts that they brought. Views and opinions, of course. I think we can squeeze in one last round. So, please. Hi. My name is Janali Bhattu. I work for Goldman Sachs. Um, my question is really around um, corporate interests sort of aligning with the government, making exceptions for certain corporates. How do you feel the government deals with? I'm talking about the telecom scandal. Um, and things like that. Uh, how do you feel that's evolving? And um, one would submit that there are still exceptions that are made for certain corporations. And how do you think that's going to, 
how how is that being dealt with, and how are we going to how is that resolving? Yeah, to you. We can promote it. I have two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is something I think you're very familiar with by now, is on the question of, uh, of, of rather the, the, the difficulty of, say, a person holding a constitutional position, revealing information, where, uh, like I said, you, I think now you're, you're familiar with, with this issue over the fact that uh, a lot of information comes out once the person's demitted office. And I, I don't think you know the issue that I'm talking about in terms of the names of the names issue. Uh, can you explain to us what, uh, what, what are these constraints that fall on the person or on the constitutional body itself? And my second question is uh, specific to the judiciary and on the, uh, on the coal allocation issue, which uh, you've, uh, you've dealt deeply into. So a few months ago, the Supreme Court ruled that all allocations since the last many years have, uh, is illegal. But uh, they also gave leeway for themselves to decide whether they're going to decide whether these are to be cancelled or not. And I think there were some quarters which said that that opened the judiciary to some amount of lobbying and uh, persuasion and uh, all sorts of activities which put it under a scanner in that light. Can you uh, share your view on, on that topic? One more, if it's there. So I'll use my prerogative to ask you the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, just going back to a debate which had surfaced uh, in the civil service almost 11 or 12 years ago, this question of autonomous regulators. What autonomous regulators? How, how do you classify uh, the autonomicity of regulators in the sense we have seen the TRAI? We have seen what has uh, now come of the TRAI. We have seen what has uh, also partly happened with the C. But how do you decide whether a regulator is autonomous? Because uh, there is this view that we seem to be going back to the same common pool of, if I can use that term in a very loose sense, retired bureaucrats, to come back and handle this autonomous regulatorships with maybe interests well aligned and defined. So in that case, uh, is, there, is this a kind of a false notion that we are pursuing in our society? So I'll, I'll just leave all that to you. Corporate interests. Uh, what I, in India, was being commonly known as uh, cronyism. Uh, in fact, I've drawn a parallel of that in the book. Uh, I've gone back to the city of uh, Vienna, uh, the then king, uh, decided that he wanted to build a very beautiful city. And he planned it along very magnificent lines. So he wanted beautiful buildings to come up pieces of pieces as pieces of art on these avenues. He chose people, called upon large business houses or whoever the prominent people with the money, and said, Okay, this avenue left side is given to you. Please build whatever you have to build, but it should be classy. In whatever way architecturally it should be good. So the city of Vienna came up in that sense. The point I'm making is only this. If the crony delivers, in some ways, maybe you can excuse the entire process of the process of all allotting that contract or whatever to, to him. But in India, unfortunately, what happened was that the crony neither had domain knowledge, nor did he have the financial capability. He was heavily financially over leveraged and that's why our, our you know um, net performing assets are where they are they have skyrocketed and more importantly he probably didn't even have the capability to be able to that's why you have a telecom license going to a real estate company that was the the way things were being handed out so 
what I guess going forward is going to happen is, I, I'm not saying that cronies will get eliminated. They don't get eliminated in any system. But the process of handing over these contracts, jobs, or bids, or whatever they may, you may call them, will be far more transparent. We'll be able to stand the test of public scrutiny to a much larger measure than they were in the past. So you may, every government, every institution has its one or two or three favorites. Favorite may still be there. But whether those favorites finally deliver or not, only time will be able to tell. Lincoln, you were mentioning about uh, revealing information. Uh, see, it's always very difficult for a person who is sitting in office, in high constitutional office or whatever it may be called, to come into media space and start talking about people, talking about pressures, talking about uh, issues which are being commented upon in media space by others. I, I have a classic example, of, unfortunately, the Prime Minister himself being misled, misled in the sense, factually being misled, of talking about various things. The options open to me were three. I could have gone to media and said that, look, Prime Minister was factually incorrect, which he was. He acknowledged it, number one. Number two was I could, as I did, take up the issue with him and I wrote him letters, which I have reproduced in, in the book. And the third was I could have just sat quiet. If I sat quiet, I would have dis done disservice to him and more to my own institution, because they were being put out into poor light in media space, and uh, that would have been incorrect. But once you demit office, it's a question of, it's not a question so much of naming people. It's a question of just discussing those issues which were already in public space. And in fact, I've quoted any amount of records in the book. But all these records are already in public domain. Nothing has been put out by me which to which only I was privy, or people like me were privy, and in some ways it contravenes government official information. It does not contravene information. Even the letters which I wrote to the Prime Minister were later given to the Joint Parliamentary Committee, and from there they got into media space, because CAG is a covered by the right to information. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I had to explain to the Prime Minister that look, we don't leak these things because the allegation was we were leaking it. If you ask me a question about a report that I'm preparing under the rule of right to information, I have to share that information with you. So I told him that look, we were officially giving this, this information out till the government decides to remedy it. Okay. So that's the kind of thing. And, <clears throat> well, yes, once I have put a lot of this into record after the meeting office in the form of a book, People, it will hurt some people who will obviously react to it. It's a part of the game. And we had, at least I had factored it in before I decided to put pen to paper. The judiciary allocating these coal mines. Uh, see, the issue is like this. Once they had declared it illegal from 1993, the judiciary, the, the verdict came in two parts. First, they said 1993, it's all illegal. Then they gave about 20 days of fortnight's time and then they came out with the final word. And that was the time within which they had asked government to come up with a response. The government's response at that time was very correct. They said that, look, 46, 40 of these mines are producing. So we will request the judiciary to spare cancellation of those mines. We will legalize that process by levying a fine or a penalty or compounding fees or whatever it may be. The six you know, who are on the threshold of producing, we will request that they also be allowed to produce. So the rest could be treated as cancelled. But when the Attorney General went before the court, and we were discussing it at lunch time today, he said, this is how we, sh we could do it. However, as far as we are concerned, we are totally prepared for whatever decision that the court gives, which means the judiciary had shut the door in your face by declaring them illegal, but it was opening a window for your reaction. That window also, government closed. The government indicated that, look, you cancel it, we are prepared. Doesn't matter, we have options available with us. The judiciary had no other option but to say, no, we cancel it. But in the process, though it appeared, as even to a person like me, appeared as a wrong decision, or it would hurt the 
economic development process. When you, when you think of it, you know, with a cool, calm mind, I think it's a good decision. Because it will bring you to square one, where you start the entire process with alacrity. The government will have to function very fast on this. I'm aware that they are planning, but I don't know how fast they will do it. And ensure that within the six months or whatever period that the judiciary has provided, re-auctions are conducted. Re-auctions, I think, I was also mentioning that a condition should be there in it, which it gives the present incumbent of that mine owner of the mine the right to a first refusal, and then get forward. So that what you will then have is only cancelling the rest minus those 40 plus or 46 mines would have less left with you with a spate of litigations. You know, but today you have a clean state. You can start what I call a T0 as a starting point where everything, every process of allocation is through an option market-driven, transparent process. So I think in the longer run, it's going to give us pain in the short run, but it will be very rewarding in the long run. And I think that that's a good decision that we took. I've said the last and the most difficult one. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, retired bureaucrats. Whatever sinecures we had, he is trying to close options to bureaucrats. It, it's certainly not a good practice to post retired bureaucrats into uh, in the role of a regulator, it's not a good practice. The, uh, the position should be open for anybody, hopefully from the market, who knows the process, or know, has domain knowledge of that particular sector. But uh, it's, it's more difficult uh, in terms of the act. Unfortunately, what the, the government has done that every act, or maybe say the power regulator, the telecom regulator, there is one clause that see it's in the fine print. The clause says government reserves the right to issue directions to the regulator. Most unhealthy issue. Should never be there. The process of regulator is you are distancing the decision making, sitting in judgment process away from government. You're making them independent, you're making them autonomous. To that extent, the fountain head will always be the government, but the Regulator should be made autonomous, and he should be left to, and that's what I call the empowerment of that institution, where it should be total autonomy to be exercised in, a, you know, in total independence. And, uh, what should I say? Not a hardcore civil servant would obviously function well in the job of a regulator. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, this is to assure all of you that the discussion doesn't uh, end here, but simply gets extended over tea and coffee that we have laid out for you outside. And on behalf of all of you, on behalf of ISAS, I thank Mr. Vinod Rai for taking his time to be here today and for sharing with us these very perceptive and what I would, uh, I think, very convincingly claim and define as insider insight on a number of things. So, uh, as a small token of our appreciation, we have this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Robin and Dr. Ronald Jansen, two of our distinguished scholars. And thank you. thank you to come back to us again and please join us for tea and coffee outside.